Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. How many of you have ever been to a magic show? It's okay, Pastor Shade's not here, you don't have to be ashamed to raise your hand. I won't tell him either. But if you've been to a magic show, you know how it goes. The magician pulls coins out of our ears. They guess the card that we draw, even though we don't show them or tell them. And sometimes they make people disappear. All right, well, maybe if you haven't been to a magic show, or you're ashamed to admit it, that's okay. What about this? Have you seen one of these before? Are the dots empty, or are they full? What about this one? Are the lines straight, or are they crooked? I'll let you argue with your neighbor there. But what do these two things have in common? What do magic tricks and these images that make our brains and our eyes hurt share? They're both illusions. Things aren't as they appear. Even though we see something, in reality, that's not actually what's happening. In one of our texts this morning, the the letter to the Hebrews says that everything is subject to Christ. But we do not see it that way. Instead, we see something else. We see an illusion, but we don't just see an illusion. We see someone else, mainly Christ, the one who has tasted death for all. So let's dive into what's happening. In the first part of Hebrews, our author shares this grand image of the power and supremacy of Christ over all creation, even the angels like we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. He talks about how the angels worship him, how Christ is the same today, tomorrow, and forever, and how all of Jesus' enemies will one day be put underneath his feet. And this last part, this feet thing, this is what our text is focused on this evening. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. So, that's pretty good news, right? But what does it mean to be put under subjection? Or what does it mean to have something underneath your feet? Well, two examples for you. One, it's much like climbing the corporate ladder. All right, now you're the boss. You're the head honcho. You're the guy. There's people underneath you. They do what you want and when you want it to do them. When you want them to do it. They're underneath your feet. Or it's also like when you can imagine back when you were a kid and you had your magnifying glass over an anthill. And you're just trying to find your next victim. You decided who lives and who dies. In that moment, those ants were underneath your feet, quite literally also. So to be underneath someone's feet is no small thing. It means complete and utter submission to the will and desires of the one whose feet you are under. This foot thing, this is what God has done. He subjected the whole world to come, not to angels, but to Christ. Christ came to earth. He was made a little lower than the angels. And he preached the repentance and the coming of the kingdom of God. And there were some who believed and others who didn't. And those who didn't believe had him killed. And Paul writes to us in Philippians, Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him above all and given him the name that is above every name. Christ humbled himself. Now he is exalted. And because of this, there is nothing, there is absolutely nothing that is outside of Christ's reign and control. There is nothing that is not underneath his feet. Because he, he is exalted by God Almighty. This is such good news. There's nothing that's not in Christ's control. Everything is underneath his feet. But not so fast. What about hurricanes? 
that cause flooding and destruction. They destroy beaches, homes, and even take lives. This surely doesn't look like everything is being made subject to Christ. In fact, it looks a lot like sin still reigning in the world. Or what about sickness and disease that take one person who is so healthy, but now they can't even get out of bed alone. They need help breathing. This doesn't look like everything is being made subject to Christ. In fact, it looks a lot like sin still reigning in the world. Or what about this? A sanctuary collapse that renders a building completely unfit for worship. That doesn't really look like everything being made subject to Christ. It looks a lot like sin still reigning in the world. And while these are only three examples, I'm sure that you could give me and we could talk for hours about the the number of things that we see that look like sin's reign in the world today. And in fact, I believe that in today's world, we're reminded on a near daily basis of what appears to be the exact opposite of Christ's reign and rule and defeat of sin, death, and the devil— the things that we confess every week. Instead, we see something else. We see sin, death, and destruction everywhere. And the writer in the Hebrews, he knows this. And so he writes to us, At the present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. At the present, right now, we do not see everything in subjection to Christ. Instead, what we see is an illusion. What we see is something that is likely to be wrongly perceived or interpreted. We look at the world around us and we see this sin and destruction, and we're not led to believe, but we're led to disbelief. Disbelief that God is actually in control. Disbelief that sin, Jesus actually defeated sin, death, and the devil. And disbelief that one day God will return and make everything right. Because what an illusion does is it puts what we believe against what we see. And it asks us, can you really believe that? Can you really believe that even though what you see is not what you believe? And with every magic trick, there's always an aha moment. The moment when the card is finally revealed, when the coin actually comes out of the ear, or when the rabbit is pulled out of the hat. Now at this time, usually when people say, ooh, ah, and they applaud to see the illusion that was before them. But what would happen, what would it be like if instead of just seeing the card or the coin or the rabbit, we saw what actually happened? We didn't see the coin happened, we saw the the fake coin come out, we saw the fake card deck, we saw the hole in the hat to pull the rabbit right out of, it would feel kind of awkward, kind of strange, because we're not supposed to know how that happens. We're supposed to just see the illusion. But if that did happen, in that moment, we would be able to see beyond the illusion, to see behind the illusion. And that is what we are able to do because of Christ. And in seeing beyond the illusion, we actually see Christ. For Christ came to earth not as an illusion, but as true God and true man. He preached the coming of the kingdom of God, and some believed it and others did not. And they had him killed. But he rose from the dead to prove that he is God, that he is the Son of God. And now he reigns in heaven until the day when he will come back to finish the work that he started. Because of this work, this work that Christ has done, is doing, we, you are able to see beyond the illusion. The writer to the Hebrews says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. While we do not see everything 
as subject or underneath Jesus' feet. We are not left to despair because we see the one who has suffered and tasted death for all, for everyone, and that includes you and I. Jesus has tasted death for you. He has tasted death for you so that you can see beyond the illusion of this present world. He has tasted death for you so that when you see the effects of sin around you, you have something to hope in and to hope for. Now when we see the destruction around us, we know, we believe that what we see is an illusion. That what we see is just merely something that is not how it is. But the world and our sinful flesh will try to tell us that there is no hope. That Jesus clearly can't have everything under his feet. Just look around. But we can say no, because we see more. We see through the illusion, and we see Christ, the one who has tasted death and the one who is coming back to finish his work of redeeming all things. So when we are faced with sin's apparent reign in our world, we can say no. This isn't proof that Christ doesn't reign. No, this is merely an illusion. Sin will not reign forever because Christ, Christ is the one who has tasted death for all. And he is the one who will come back one day and defeat sin, death, and the devil forever. There will be no more. And there will be no more illusion. Because all, everyone will see everything underneath the feet of Jesus. In the name of the one who has come and will come again, Jesus Christ. Amen.